There you go. You got it. I think so. Okay. No, you had it for a second. Good morning. Thank you. Let's try that again. Good morning. On May 27th, 2016, Ms. Hurd walked into a courthouse in Los Angeles, California to get a no-notice ex-party restraining order against Mr. Depp, and in doing so, ruined his life by falsely telling the world that she was a survivor of domestic abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. Today, on May 27th, 2022, exactly six years later, we ask you to give Mr. Depp his life back by telling the world that Mr. Depp is not the abuser Ms. Hurd said he is, and hold Ms. Hurd accountable for her lies. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as you probably know by now, my name is Camille Vasquez. On behalf of Mr. Depp and all my colleagues at Brown Rednick, I want to thank you deeply for your time and your service over these last seven weeks. We understand that it probably has not been convenient for you to be here every day, and we are so grateful for your time and careful consideration of the evidence as you deliberate. After weeks of sitting in this courtroom, listening to testimony and looking at evidence, now it's time for you, the jury, to come to a decision. You have been entrusted with a serious task. What is at stake in this trial is a man's good name. Even more than that, what is at stake at this trial is a man's life. The life that he lost when he was accused of a heinous crime and the life he could live when he is finally vindicated. Exactly six years ago today, on May 27, 2016, Ms. Hurd walked into court and filed a false report of domestic abuse against her husband of 15 months, Johnny Depp. The scene was a setup. She tipped off the paparazzi so they would be waiting. They knew exactly where she would pause, which side of her face to photograph. And the photos captured what she wanted them to see, the image of a battered woman. What the paparazzi did not know is that the dark mark on her face mysteriously appeared six days after last seeing Mr. Depp. It was a lie. She knew it. Mr. Depp knew it. And the multiple witnesses you heard from who saw her that week of May 21st, 2016, also knew it. But the world only saw what she wanted them to see. Two years later, when promoting the biggest role of her career until this trial, Ms. Hurd presented herself to the world as a public figure representing domestic abuse. The headline of the op-ed featured the term sexual violence, even though she had never before accused her ex-husband of such a heinous crime. Ms. Hurd and her lawyers love to remind you of how the op-ed did not mention Mr. Depp by name, but Ms. Hurd made sure that there would be no mistake about who she was referring to. She inserted two years ago, so the world would remember the photo of a battered woman, the mark on her face standing outside the courthouse, and they would once again see Mr. Depp as the villain, this time in full swing of the Me Too movement. But what was happening behind closed doors was quite different from what Ms. Hurd presented to the world. The exact opposite, in fact. There is, a, there is an abuser in this courtroom, but it is not Mr. Depp. And there is a victim of domestic abuse in this courtroom, but it is not Ms. Hurd. The evidence presented at this trial has shown that Ms. Hurd is in fact the abuser, and Mr. Depp the abused. As you heard from Mr. Depp and multiple other witnesses that testified under oath at this trial, Mr. Depp experienced persistent verbal, physical, and emotional abuse by Ms. Hurd during their relationship. And when their relationship was over, Ms. Hurd inflicted the greatest and cruelest injury of all. 
she publicly and falsely named Mr. Depp as the abuser. Ms. Hurd never thought she would be held accountable, never thought that she would have to face her abuser. She never thought she would, never, she would have her supposed mountain of evidence vetted. She never thought that Mr. Depp would tell you, the jury, and the world that he was the real victim of domestic abuse. She said it in her own words. Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, man, I, I'm a victim of the domestic violence, and yes. I, you know, it's a fair fight. And see how many people believe or side with you. At the start of this case, Mr. Chu and I stood before you to give you our opening statements on behalf of Mr. Depp. During that statement, we made promises to you about what the evidence would ultimately show at the end of this trial. We've kept those promises. One of those promises we made was that you would come to understand who Ms. Hurd is, that she is a deeply troubled person, violently afraid of abandonment, desperate for attention and approval. And in her relationship with Mr. Depp, she was violent, she was abusive, and she was cruel. You heard from Dr. Shannon Curry, who explained that Ms. Hurd suffers from borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder. These are disorders that are characterized by anger sometimes uncontrollable and explosive anger, and a powerful, sometimes desperate need for attention, acceptance, and approval. Fear of abandonment is the deepest fear. A person with these disorders will suffer from dramatically fluctuating moods and can sometimes be violent and aggressive. They can also be charming and likable, but they can be incredibly manipulative and wild. An emotional roller coaster with wild swings from idolizing their partner to devaluing him. In fact, you saw that when she completed testing with her own forensic psychology expert, Dr. Don Hughes. Ms. Hurd self-reported that she felt like she had three or four different personalities and that sometimes her temper would explode and she'd completely lose control. You heard from multiple witnesses that Ms. Hurd can be very pleasant, even charming, but you also heard from multiple witnesses and in audio recordings of Ms. Heard that she can be incredibly aggressive, violent, and cruel. You heard that even from her former assistant, Kate James, Ms. James testified that Ms. Heard would scream, yell, and send her barrages of text messages. In fact, Ms. Heard testified that Ms. Ms. James testified that Ms. Heard literally spat in her face. You heard from Ms. Hurd's former best friend, Rocky Pennington, that Ms. Hurd once hit her when Ms. Pennington did not do her best to meet Ms. Hurd's needs. You also heard from Beverly Leonard that she once witnessed Ms. Hurd assault her then partner in Seattle Airport in 2009. And you heard from Mr. Depp that Ms. Hurd used her sister Whitney as a punching bag, literally and figuratively. You also heard overwhelming evidence from Mr. Depp and the people that were around him and Ms. Heard during their relationship that Mr. Depp suffered persistent verbal and physical abuse at the hands of Ms. Heard. You've ex heard evidence from Dr. Curry and the fact witnesses at this trial that Ms. Heard's deepest fear is one of abandonment, being left by Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp's greatest crime in her mind the fault she confronts him with time and time again is that he splits. He leaves the fight, especially when Ms. Heard gets physical. And she couldn't stand it when he did. You heard from Ms. Heard yourselves in audio recordings how upsetting it was to her when Mr. Depp would split. Anytime anything goes wrong, you split. I feel like it's your first thing. It's unnecessary. It's not always uh, you're splitting because there's blows or because there's yelling or anything. You split many, most times when I'm still speaking in this volume and nothing has been thrown or hit or anything. You saw the barrage of text messages she would send when he would leave, calling him a monster for doing so. You heard from witnesses like Travis McGivern, Tara Roberts, and Debbie Lloyd that Ms. Heard would claw at Mr. Depp, block the elevator, 
throw a punch when Mr. Depp tried to separate himself from the fight. And you heard from Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's couple therapist, Dr. Anderson, that Ms. Hurd reported that when Mr. Depp would leave to de-escalate a fight, she would strike him to keep him there because she would rather be in a fight than have him leave. You heard from Mr. Depp about how often Ms. Hurd would berate him, insult him, and physically attack him, including one of the most serious occasions when Ms. Hurd threw a vodka bottle at Mr. Depp, severely injuring his finger, and then put a cigarette out on his face. You heard from Mr. Depp that this whole incident in Australia started because Ms. Hurd was enraged that Mr. Depp wanted a post-nuptial agreement, and she wasn't in his will just a month after getting married. When her husband was seriously injured and bleeding from a partially amputated finger, what did Ms. Hurd do? She pursued him. She kept coming after him. Because that's what she does. She wouldn't stop. It's, it's, it, it's not to get you mad. It's, not to get, it's just to get out of a bad situation that's happening before it gets worse. In Australia, when we had the big fight where I lost the tip of my finger, at least five bathrooms and two bedrooms I went to. To, to, to avoid talking to me, to, to avoid escape working the, out. That's to the escape problem. the fight. You don't escape the fight, you escape the solution. No. You escape the solution. No. You s escape figuring it out. We cannot work it out if you run away to the bathroom every time. You heard Mr. Depp testify. He went through something like a nervous breakdown that day. And he wrote a lot of things on mirrors and other places. Again, what did Ms. Hurd do as her husband was bleeding from serious injury? She wrote snarky messages right back to him. She denied it under oath to you, but the evidence you saw speaks for itself. You heard from Mr. Depp's security, Sean Bett, who was aware of constant arguing and bickering. He witnessed Ms. Hurd calling Mr. Depp names. Fat ass. Fuck you, Johnny. Mr. Bett testified that he saw and documented injuries on Mr. Depp. A swollen eyelid in March of 2015, cuts on his nose, scratch marks on his chin in December of 2015. And you heard from Travis McGivern, who testified that Ms. Hurd called Mr. Depp names like washed up, fucking cunt, and worst of all, a fucking deadbeat dad. Ms. Hurd would take the low blows and hit him where it hurts, his children. Mr. McGivern told you that on March 23rd, 2015, Ms. Hurd threw things at Mr. Depp, spat at him, and ultimately punched him in the face, leaving him with a shiner. You heard testimony from Malcolm Connolly, another security member, who testified he saw Ms. Hurd throw things at Mr. Depp, a cigarette lighter on a plane, a soda can from upstairs at the Eastern Columbia building. He never saw marks on Ms. Hurd, but he saw marks on Mr. Depp, scratches, bruises on his left eye, scratches on his left ear. And he took pictures documenting injuries like this one. You also heard from Tara Roberts, a manager at Mr. Depp's Island, who witnessed Ms. Hurd telling Mr. Depp that he was washed up and would die fat and lonely. You also heard from Ms. Roberts that she witnessed Ms. Hurd clawing and grabbing at Mr. Depp, grabbing his hair, trying to pull him back to her, and Mr. Depp had a visible injury to his nose on that occasion. Most importantly, you heard from Ms. Hurd yourselves on multiple audio recordings, admitting to being physically violent with Mr. Depp. You heard Ms. Hurd admit to hitting Mr. Depp. And then you fucking clocked me. I, I remember hitting you as a response to the door thing. Mm. And I'm really sorry about hitting you at the door or, or hitting your head. I did not mean to, nor... You didn't uh, mean to hit me in the head with the door, but you meant to I didn't punch mean, me in the jaw. I meant to hit you, and I, I 
I did not do this thing with the door. I, I do remember, I did mean to hit you. So that you didn't yeah. mean? The door? No, God, no, I didn't. I'm, For punching me in the, in the jaw. I didn't, you did. okay, I'm sorry I hit you. I did mean to hit you, but it was in, a res, in response. I just reacted in response to my foot. I just reacted. And you heard her admit it again and claim Mr. Depp was a baby for complaining about the abuse. And I, I watched you lie. And then I, I didn't I punch you, by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, you've been a lot of fights. You've been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, when you fucking have a close You face. didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this. But I did not punch you. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. I don't know what the motion of my actual hand was. But you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are you? How, what am I supposed to do? Do this? I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. That's the difference between me and you. You're a fucking baby. Because you start. You are such a baby. Grow the fuck up, did you Johnny. Start physical fights. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get the fuck out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You're admirable. Take a minute to really think about what you just heard there. Quote, I'm sorry that I didn't hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. I was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Imagine that was Mr. Depp saying that to Miss Heard on that recording. Let's play one more. That's fake laugh. That fake laugh is too much to say. No, I'm sure she's... That's fake laugh. It's so, so disgusting. I'm sure she's great. I'm sure she's great. I'm thinking that you've been giving me some no. of the best performances in no, the world. No, no, you're show. right. I don't. It's all about performance. It's about performance. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I don't regret that. I don't regret that. Oh, what else? I don't what else are you doing? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. What else? What else other things do you want to add? Can't talk you fucking lie to people. You want? Oh, no. I want to know. I want to know. Get out of your Uber drive. I'm kind of waiting. You go get it. <laughs> yeah, I'll be in the Wait, is there no other place for you to run in your 15 and a half wheels to go run? Come on, go be a real married man. Go deal with your shit the way that a man does. Go run to the next house. Every man does. Yeah. Go. go run away. This is the real Miss Heard. The one in the audio recordings. Not the one you saw in this courtroom. What you didn't hear on a single recording you heard in this case, and there were many played by both parties, is Mr. Depp ever admitting to hitting, punching, or kicking Ms. Heard. You didn't hear it. It doesn't exist. It didn't happen. And despite the fact that Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard are heard discussing many of the alleged incidents you've heard about at this trial, like Australia and the Bahamas, you never heard Ms. Heard accuse Mr. Depp of sexual assault. Unlike Mr. Depp, who you heard admit to and own up to his past mistakes and his struggles, particularly with drugs and alcohol, Ms. Heard will not admit that she, has never that she has ever done anything wrong. But she cannot deny what you heard on those recordings. As much as Ms. Heard and her lawyers have tried to make this case about Mr. Depp's language, it is Ms. Heard that repeatedly admits to violence. By April and May of 2016, Mr. Depp had reached his limit. His mother was dying. His finances were a mess. And when he showed up late to Ms. Heard's 30th birthday party because a meeting with his new business manager, Edward White, had gone late, Ms. Heard, of course, was not understanding. She was furious. You heard from Mr. Depp, both in this courtroom and on audio recordings, that Ms. Heard punched him that evening. He left with Travis McGivern, and the next morning he learned that someone had left feces on his bed. Ms. Heard denies responsibility, but she admitted to the prank to Starling Jenkins. You heard him testify to that effect. 
For almost a month after that, they didn't see each other. And you heard from Mr. Depp that when his mother died on May 20th, 2016, he resolved to leave Ms. Heard. He was done. And when Ms. Heard learned that Mr. Depp was done, that she was really losing him, she went on the attack. She filed for divorce before Mr. Depp could. Then, as you heard from Mr. Depp's divorce lawyer, Laura Wasser, Ms. Heard sent a letter demanding financial support. And when her demands weren't met, Ms. Heard struck a blow against Mr. Depp that was more damaging than any physical blow she had ever landed. When she walked into court six years ago today, on May 27, 2016, to get a domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, she did so in front of paparazzi with a mark on her face. The evidence presented at this trial demonstrates that Ms. Heard didn't just want a divorce. She wanted to ruin him. Ms. Heard denied alerting TMZ to the TRO filing in this courtroom. But you heard testimony from Morgan Tremaine that TMZ knew to go to the courthouse, knew what side of her face the alleged bruise was on, and that Ms. Heard would pause. She would pause for paparazzi who got the photos that ended up splashed across newspapers and magazines. Ms. Heard testified that she did not personally give photographs of her apparent injuries to People magazine. But somehow, these pictures that she took and maintained on her devices ended up on the cover of People magazine one month later. In the end, she walked away with $7 million without any tax liabilities, which she said she was donating to two charities, the ACLU and the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. The ACLU, they got less than a million dollars from her. And the Children's Hospital, they got $250,000. But that didn't stop Ms. Heard from telling the world that she donated everything. Because remember, she wanted nothing and she had donated everything. The word donated. And that didn't stop her from testifying under the penalty of perjury that she had donated it. Ms. Heard tried to tell you that pledge and donate mean the same thing. She claims she hasn't given the money because she was sued, but you've heard on contested evidence that she had the money for 13 months prior to this lawsuit being commenced by Mr. Depp. She had all the money and had month after month after month to, to fulfill her pledge and actually donate the money, but she didn't. She also told you that she never fulfilled the pledge because Mr. Depp sued her for defamation. That's a blatant lie. After the divorce was finalized, when she sought to initiate an arbitration against Mr. Depp for defamation three months before the op-ed was even published, and six months before Mr. Depp filed this lawsuit. Not only does this contradict Ms. Heard's excuse for not making donations, it contradicts her narrative that she just wants to move on with her life, that she just wants Mr. Depp to leave her alone. Lies. That is Ms. Heard's narrative. Lies upon lies. There, and actually were all kinds of accusations uh, flying your way when you said all this and then there was a divorce settlement you got seven million dollars people were saying this is all about the money but then you did something that uh, twisted that whole argument what did you do with that money seven million dollars in total was donated to i split it between the aclu and children's hospital of los angeles aclu is a human rights organization sorry aclu is a prominent um uh, organization, nonprofit organization. Heard in a lie, she tries to cover it up with more lies. So let's talk about the giant lie at the heart of this case. Ms. Heard's claim that Mr. Depp is an abusive monster and that she is a public figure representing domestic abuse. At the start of this case, Mr. Chu and I told you that you were going to hear some disturbing 
and graphic tales of abuse were misheard. And they were designed to shock you and overwhelm you, which you have. We told you that this would be a performance, the role of her lifetime, as a heroic survivor, survivor of brutal abuse. When Mr. Depp brought this case for defamation, Ms. Heard went all in. She spun a story of shocking, overwhelming, brutal abuse. She came into this courtroom prepared to give the performance of her life, and she gave it. Ms. Heard Ms. Heard's acting coach, Christina Sexton, testified that Ms. Heard has difficulty crying when she is acting. You saw it. Ms. Heard sobbing without tears while spinning elaborate, exaggerated, fantastical accounts of abuse and everything going on in her mind almost a decade prior while enduring that abuse. It was a performance. She told you that what she thinks about Excuse me. She told you what she thinks you need to hear to convict this man as a domestic abuser and a rapist. She wants you to believe that she was abused countless times. Countless times over the entire course of their relationship. But as Mr. Chu and I promised you, the evidence just does not bear that out. Ms. Hurd has told you that she has mountains of evidence of abuse. But there are no medical records reflecting she sustained any injuries from the abuse she claims. Ms. Hurd had medical professionals at her disposal. Dr. Kipper, Debbie Lloyd, her own nurse, Erin Filotti. And yet, there is nothing. Ms. Hurd took pictures all the time. Pictures of Mr. Depp sleeping. Pictures of cocaine, pictures of property damage, pictures of herself. And as an actress, she was photographed all the time. Where are the pictures of the horrific injuries Ms. Hurd describes? Ms. Hurd also took audio recordings and videos frequently. Where are the videos of Mr. Depp attacking her? Where are the audio recordings of Mr. Depp admitting to or apologizing for physical abuse? There are none. What Ms. Hurd has and what you've seen multiple times is a video of Mr. Depp banging some cabinets around in a kitchen. A video that based on the testimony you heard from Morgan Tremaine, the former TMZ employee, Ms. Hurd seems to have sold to TMZ right before she was deposed in connection with her divorce from Mr. Depp. Sure, Ms. Hurd can point to text messages where Mr. Depp is apologizing to her, but never for violence. Ms. Hurd's counsel showed you Defendant's Exhibit 325, where Mr. Depp says sorry for, quote, my behavior. I'm a fucking savage. But this is not an apology for violence. It's an apology for the, quote, these heinous, slinging insults. Mr. Depp is apologizing for the words he used. Unlike Ms. Hurd, who you heard apologizing for physical violence in multiple audio recordings, you have never heard that from Mr. Depp because he never used physical violence against Ms. Hurd. Ms. Hurd told you that Mr. Depp started abusing her right from the very beginning of her relationship, starting at the beginning of 2012. But she has repeatedly testified under oath differently to having spent a year of bliss with Mr. Depp before he ever laid a hand on her. And now, now in this courtroom, she has suddenly erased an entire year of magic. She wants you to believe that instead of hitting her after a year of magic, Mr. Depp was hitting her immediately. The good times she has testified to about repeatedly in the past apparently never happened. And with the good times erased, Ms. Hurd wants you to believe that she gave Mr. Depp a big knife that said, 
hasta la muerte, until death, to the man who supposedly would get drunk and high and beat her. Ms. Hurd admitted to you during this trial that Mr. Depp always wears big, chunky rings on every finger. According to her, he was wearing these rings when he'd slap her, hit her, punch her in the face. But you have not seen a, seen a single photograph that reflects the serious injuries Ms. Hurd would have sustained if this was true. Not one. Ms. Hurd testified to an incident in March 2013 when Mr. Depp supposedly hit her multiple times in the face while wearing rings. And this is what her face looked like afterwards. Ms. Hurd testified to an incident in Russia where she claims Mr. Depp whacked her in the face and gave her a bloody nose. She didn't take pictures of her bloody nose, but her photograph was taken on that trip. And this is what she looked like. Ms. Hurd told you that there was an incident the night of the Met Gala in May 2014 when Mr. Depp supposedly whacked Ms. Hurd in the face, leaving her with a red, discolored, and swoll swollen nose that she felt was broken. Ms. Hurd didn't show you any photographs of these alleged injuries, but photographs were taken of her the following night, and there were no visible injuries to Ms. Hurd's face. Ms. Hurd testified that in January 2015, while she and Mr. Depp were in Tokyo, Mr. Depp knelt on her back so aggressively that she was concerned that bruises would be visible in her backless dress. Here's Ms. Hurd in that backless dress. Ms. Hurd testified that after an incident in December 2015, she had she two had black, two black eyes, eyes, a broken nose, and chunks of hair missing. The assault was allegedly so violent that there was blood left all over the pillows, and Mr. Depp had broken the bed frame. Pictures were taken of that bed frame. And in that picture, there, there appears to be a pocket knife on the bed. And that picture fails to capture the bloody pillows. And here is what Ms. Hurd looked like on the James Corden show the next day. Indeed, you heard from Ms. Hurd's own nurse, Erin Filotti, that she saw her a day or two afterwards and could not visualize the injuries Ms. Hurd described. Ms. Hurd did take pictures of herself after this alleged incident. But are the injuries reflected in these photographs consistent? That's the question. Are they consistent with the brutal assault and serious injuries Ms. Hurd has testified to? Or are these injuries more consistent with Mr. Depp's testimony? that he and Ms. Hurd bumped heads while he was trying to restrain Ms. Hurd to keep her from attacking him. Out of Australia, where Mr. Depp sustained the most serious injury from his relationship with Ms. Hurd, Ms. Hurd spun a story of horror. A three-day ordeal with, drug, with a drug-fueled Mr. Depp violently assaulting her, cutting his own finger off, dragging her through glass, and then bending her back over a counter and raping her with a whiskey bottle. She claimed that she had bruises on her face, 
cuts all over her arms and feet, and was bleeding from her vagina from the sexual assault. And what did Ms. Hurd say she did? She went upstairs, took some sleeping pills, and went to sleep. The next morning, she took pictures of the mirrors her husband had written on in paint using his amputated finger. She took no pictures of herself, her alleged injuries, or the property damage she testified to in this courtroom. When Malcolm Connolly, Jerry Judge, Dr. Kipper, and Nurse Debbie Lloyd arrived to extract Mr. Depp and get him medical treatment for his finger injury, you heard from Mr. Connolly, Dr. Kipper, and Ms. Lloyd, all of them testified they did not observe any injuries to Ms. Hurd. And no one, including Ms. Hurd, testified that she sought medical treatment. You also heard from Ben King. He also saw Ms. Hurd right after this alleged incident. He flew home with her to Los Angeles. He testified that Ms. Hurd didn't want to leave, that she said, I can't leave, I can't leave. It will be the end if I leave. He also testified that once they did leave for Los Angeles, Ms. Hurd asked him if he ever got so mad he just lost it. When Ms. Hurd arrived in Los Angeles, she saw Travis McGivern, who also testified he observed no injuries, and her personal nurse, Erin Filotti, who documented no request for medical treatment and no injuries in her nursing notes for Ms. Hurd. You heard from Mr. Depp's sister, Christy, that she also saw Ms. Hurd when she arrived back to Los Angeles and observed no injuries on Ms. Hurd. Christy testified that when she told Ms. Hurd her fighting with Mr. Depp was unsustainable, Ms. Hurd responded that Christy should get off her cross, that Mr. Depp liked her feisty. Ms. Hurd's testimony about what occurred in Australia just doesn't add up. That's because there was a monster in that house in Australia, but it wasn't Mr. Depp. It was Ms. Hurd. Other than Ms. Hurd's testimony, all the evidence you've seen in this trial shows that it was Ms. Hurd who attacked and grievously wounded Mr. Depp when she threw a vodka bottle at him, severing his finger. Mr. Depp told Dr. Kipper that when Dr. Kipper arrived to treat Mr. Depp's finger, you've seen the pictures of the bar area in Australia with the broken vodka bottles on the ground and trails of blood drops on the floor and a bloody tissue on the floor. You've heard from Ben King that the tip of Mr. Depp's finger was found in the same bar area. And you heard from Dr. Gilbert that the injury to Mr. Depp's finger could have been caused exactly as he described. And interestingly, you heard from Christina Sexton that Ms. Hurd told her that Mr. Depp injured his finger while swinging a bottle around. Not smashing a phone, as Ms. Hurd surmised in this courtroom, but swinging a bottle around. You also heard from Ms. Sexton that Ms. Hurd first told her about the bottle rape in Australia while Ms. Sexton was at Ms. Hurd's home, meeting with her lawyers the day before Ms. Sexton was scheduled to be deposed in this case. The evidence presented at this trial shows that this is not the only time that Ms. Hurd disclosed a sexual assault at a convenient time for purposes of litigation she's involved in. The first time Ms. Hurd claimed that Mr. Depp sexually assaulted her in the Bahamas in December 2015 was after Tara Roberts, the manager of Mr. Depp's island, submitted a sworn statement in the UK action describing the incident she testified to in this courtroom, where Ms. Hurd chased Mr. Depp out of the house, was yelling and then pleading with Mr. Depp to stay while clawing at his hair and clothes, and left Mr. Depp with an injury to his face. That's the first time she disclosed it after there was contrary evidence. Ms. Hurd testified about another incident just two weeks after the events in Australia, where Mr. Depp supposedly attacked Ms. Hurd and almost pushed her sister Whitney down the stairs. Whitney is the only witness that you heard from that backs up Ms. Hurd's version of events. She's it. And the only witness other than Ms. Hurd who claims to have seen Mr. Depp physically attack Ms. Hurd. But just like Ms. Hurd's version of the events in Australia, her testimony about the staircase incident and that of her sister Whitney's 
just doesn't square up with the other evidence in this trial. Their testimony is contradicted by the testimony of Travis McGivern and Debbie Lloyd, who were there that night. Ms. Hurd and Whitney testified that Mr. Depp threw a Red Bull can that hit or almost hit Ms. Lloyd. Ms. Lloyd testified that never happened. Mr. McGivern testified that it was Ms. Hurd who threw a can at Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd testified that Whitney was between her and Mr. Depp when she punched him. Mr. McGivern testified that he was the one between Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp when Ms. Hurd punched Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd testified that Mr. Depp was able to get his hands in her hair, yank her, and then hit her in the face with the cast he had on. But you heard from Ms. Lloyd and Dr. Kolber, Mr. Depp's medical doctor, who treated Mr. Depp's finger injury, that Mr. Depp's finger was in a delicate state. He had a pin in his finger, a skin graft, and a soft cast that immobilized Mr. Depp's two middle fingers. And tellingly, the only picture of an injury from this incident is of Mr. Depp with a shiner. And then we have May 21st, 2016. Ms. Hurd testified that Mr. Depp threw a phone at her face causing a visible injury. Ms. Hurd has shown you pictures she claims to show this injury. But these photographs are not to be trusted. You heard from Mr. Neumeister that like many of the photographs Ms. Hurd has presented in this case, these photos were stored in a photo editing application. And these photos show signs of manipulation. These two photographs were taken at the exact same time and have the exact same file name. But they are visually different. One shows significantly more redness on Ms. Hurd's face than the other, which doesn't show any injury at all. Ms. Hurd testified the difference is explained by turning on a light. But there is no way Ms. Hurd could have taken a picture, turned on a light, and then taken another picture with every hair in the exact same place within the same second. It's impossible. Moreover, you heard from multiple witnesses, including Officer Melissa Sines, Officer Tyler Haddon, and Officer William Gatlin, Isaac Baruch, Alejandro Romero, who saw Ms. Hurd on or after May 21st, and saw no injuries to her face before she showed up to that courthouse with a mark on May 27th. And the very next day after Ms. Hurd walked into court, with what appeared to be a bruise on her face to obtain a domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, Ms. Hurd was photographed laughing with her best friend, fresh-faced, with no bruise on her face. The mountain of evidence that Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd is simply not there. What we have is a mountain of unproven allegations that are wild, over the top, and implausible. And you can't pick and choose which of these wild allegations to believe and which ones to disregard. You either believe all of it or none of it. Either Mr. Depp sexually assaulted Ms. Hurd with a bottle in Australia, or Ms. Hurd got up on that stand in front of all of you and made up that horrific tale of abuse. Either she's a victim of truly horrific abuse or she is a woman who is willing to say absolutely anything. It is disturbing to think that Ms. Hurd would make up the horrific tales of abuse that she testified to in this courtroom. But this case doesn't come down to whether you believe Ms. Hurd or you believe Mr. Depp. This case comes down to whether you believe Ms. Hurd or you believe Mr. Depp, Christy Dombrowski, Sean Bett, Malcolm Connolly, Travis McGivern, Starling Jenkins, Keenan Wyatt, Dr. Kipper, nurses Debbie Lloyd and Aaron Filotti, Tara Roberts, Ben King, Kate James, 
Kate Moss, Dr. Kolber, Morgan Knight, Morgan Tremaine, Officers Melissa Sines, Officers Tyler Haddon, Officer William Gatlin, and Beverly Leonard. What Ms. Hurd testified to in this courtroom is the story of far too many women. But the overwhelming evidence and weight of that evidence shows that it's not her story. It's not Ms. Hurd's story. It was an act of profound cruelty, not just to Mr. Depp, but to true survivors of domestic abuse. For Ms. Hurd to hold herself out as a public figure representing domestic abuse. It was false, it was defamatory, and it caused irreparable harm. And to talk more about that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and my friend, Mr. Chu. Thank you, Camille. Logistics are not our strong suit. And thanks to all of you, truly, for taking so much time over these last several weeks to listen to Mr. Depp, to his friends, to his family, and to so many others who have come forward physically in this courtroom, some from a very long distance, to tell you the truth. And to finally, after so many years, to correct the record. As Ms. Vasquez said, you have now come to know the real Amber Heard. Scary. We also told you at the start of this trial that you were going to come to know the real Johnny Depp, not the many characters you've seen him play so wonderfully in the movies, but the man himself. We kept that promise. You've met the real Johnny Depp. You have heard that Mr. Depp came from humble, very difficult beginnings. You have heard from Mr. Depp's big sister, who's here in the courtroom today, Christy Dombrowski, who told you how Mr. Depp grew up in a deeply troubled household with a mother, Betty Sue, who was physically abusive and mentally cruel. As Ms. Dombrowski testified, one of the names that Betty Sue called Mr. Depp, when he was a little boy, was one eye because he had to wear an eye patch for some time. His mother used to hit his father and the kids, including young Mr. Depp. And when his mother got violent, Mr. Depp would retreat and find a place to hide. Sometimes he and his sister Christy would find a place to hide together. Mr. Depp never hit back. And like his father, he either stood up and took the violence or he retreated from it. Those are habits he returned to later when he found himself in a relationship with another person who returned his love with abuse, with physical abuse. And despite this long, unhappy history with his mother, Johnny never turned his back on her. In her elder years, Mr. Depp moved his mother to California, and he moved her to Los Angeles right across the street from his house so his two children could get to know her. He hired nurses for his mother. He made sure to take care of her and to make her comfortable. She never went to hospice. She had the nurses. Make her comfortable to the day she died. And from those humble and difficult beginnings, Mr. Depp grew into one of the greatest actors and movie stars of his generation. Now, he came to Los Angeles with his first love as a young man, planning to be a musician. 
Music had been a part of his life ever since he found peace himself in his room as a young boy when he was escaping and he would learn, he learned to play the guitar and would use it as solace. But it was an actor as his star began its rise as he appeared in films too many to mention, including, of course, his iconic role as Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Fame came with challenges to Mr. Depp and his family. It was a strange experience for a shy young man from Kentucky to be thrust into the limelight, pursued by paparazzi, and to have even his very name become a brand. But he did his best to live a private, quiet life and despite it all, and over the years built a, re a reputation as a respected artist and as a decent, very well-liked man, which you've heard from many people. Mr. Depp dated major figures like Winona Ryder, Kate Moss, and Vanessa Paradis, with whom he spent 14 years together and with whom they had their children. Before Amber Heard, ladies and gentlemen, no woman ever, no woman ever before Amber Heard ever claimed that Mr. Depp raised a hand to her in his 58 years. And no other woman since Ms. Heard made that false claim back on May 17, May 27, 2016, has, and repeated it in her December 2018 op-ed has any woman come forward since? This is Me Too without any Me Too. To the contrary, ladies and gentlemen, you heard Kate Moss two days ago testify. This is a woman who has never testified in any proceeding, ever. A very private person. Testified that Mr. Depp never abused her and that Ms. Heard lied to you, and she lied to you twice when she told you. Objection, Your Honor. That Ms. Short. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, as I was saying, Ms. Heard lied to you twice when she suggested to you that Mr. Depp pushed Kate Moss down the stairs. You told her, you heard her say just two days ago that Mr. Depp never did that and he never hit her and he never kicked her. That was one of objection, Your Honor. That's not what you testified it's to. Exactly. We just what you discussed testified. that. Overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. They're still at it. Ms. Hurd and her lawyers have spent much of this trial talking about drugs and alcohol. Mr. Depp is no saint, and he has never claimed to be one. He has made mistakes in his life, as we all have. Yes, he has struggled with drugs and alcohol, but you never heard him deny that. We told you that in the opening statement. He owns his flaws. He admits to them. He told you all about them. But he is not a violent abuser. He's not abuser, as Ms. Heard claims. And he did not and does not deserve to have his life, his legacy, destroyed by a vicious lie. And this is, as Ms. Vasquez said, this is the sixth anniversary of that. There is a world of difference between having substance abuse problems and being a physical abuser. Ms. Heard falsely accused Mr. Depp of beating her. That was her first allegation, and you know why, and you know that wasn't true. Then, years, years after the fact, for the first time, she accused him of raping her. The lies have grown and metastasized over time, and they need to be stopped. And those false accusations have caused more harm to Mr. Depp than her fists ever did. And make no mistake, 
Ms. Hurd has admitted, unlike Mr. Depp, Ms. Hurd has admitted on the audio tapes you've heard at this trial, and Ms. Vasquez just played you a, a, a few of them, she has admitted repeatedly to physically abusing Mr. Depp. And I would just like to take a minute to talk about the harm to Mr. Depp and his family. You have heard from several of the people in Mr. Depp's life about the damage Ms. Hurd's lies have done to him. You heard from his sister, Christy, who told you how hard it has been on his family and on her little brother personally. You heard from Mr. Depp's friend of four decades, and that speaks volumes about Mr. Depp. He has lifetime friends who appear for him. Mr. Baruch told you how Mr. Depp and his family had been, quote, completely wrecked, unquote, by Ms. Hurd's lies. You heard Mr. Depp testify that he has lost nothing less than everything because of Ms. Hurd's lies. Nothing less than everything. You heard about Mr. Depp's children, Jack and Lily Rose. His children have had to hear these allegations since 2016. And then that, when that started to die down, they had to hear them again. This time in December 2018, this time in the Washington Post, which is a national and international publication. And Mr. Depp has had to live with the knowledge that his children will keep hearing those false rumors and statements against him. Mr. Depp has millions of fans, people who have heard, who grew up watching him on 21 Jump Street, which is something you heard Miss Heard mock on one of the tapes that was played to you. Or they grew up watching him play the swashbuckling pirate Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, or Willy Wonka. Mr. Depp means something to those people, and those people mean a lot to Mr. Depp. He's a fond memory from childhood or adolescence, or adulthood. And to tarnish him as an abuser is to destroy him in the eyes of many of these people who will never look at him the same way again. And because of what Ms. Hurd did, and because of what she said, Mr. Depp will go to his grave knowing, matter, knowing no matter what he does, no matter the outcome of this trial, there are people who used to look up to him who now believe that he beat a woman, which is the worst thing you can say about a man. Beyond the personal and emotional effects of Ms. Hurd's lies, their impact on Mr. Depp and his family, the damage she inflicted on his reputation and career is un undeniable. There's an old saying that a good reputation takes a lifetime to build, but only a second to destroy. Mr. Depp spent, in fact, a lifetime building his reputation as one of the greatest actors and movie stars of his generation, an iconic figure respected through, and liked throughout Hollywood and recognized and admired throughout the world. You heard evidence from Jack Wiggum, who was here today, Mr. Depp's agent, who explained that Mr. Depp, quote, was very well regarded and respected by peers in the artistic community, unquote. And you heard further testimony from Mr. Wiggum that Mr. Depp had a deal with Disney to play Captain Jack Sparrow in the sixth movie sequel of the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, franchise for $22.5 million. But as Mr. Wiggum explained, all of that changed when Ms. Hurd published her op-ed in December of 2018 in the Washington Post. Quoting from the testimony you heard by Mr. Wiggum, quote, after the op-ed, it was impossible to get him a studio film, which is what we normally would have focused on in that time period, unquote. Another quote, it was on the damage, the impact of this op-ed, as opposed to the other stories that you, you saw, the other publications. Mr. Wiggum explained why this one was so damaging, quote, it was a first person account. I mean, from the victim. It's extremely impactful. You know, with respect to Johnny, it was catastrophic because it was coming from a first-person account. It was not from a journalist. It was coming from someone observing. It was from someone saying, this happened to me, unquote. You also heard from Richard Marks, an expert in the inner workings of Hollywood and the entertainment industry, 
who explained that the impact of Ms. Hurd's allocations on Mr. Depp was devastating. Quote, it's devastating. It's the type of claim, the Me Too claim of sexual violence, domestic abuse, that has canceled a list of actors, unquote. And for many, and Mr. Depp would agree with this, rightfully so, Me Too is an important movement, a movement that Mr. Depp supports and believes in. It's for true survivors of abuse, not Ms. Hurd. True victims need protection, and true, true perpetrators need to face the repercussions. But as you heard in this case, Amber Heard is not a true victim, and Mr. Depp certainly is not an abuser. Again, nobody has come out of the woodwork to say, me too. This is the unique and singular me too case where there's not a single Me Too. In fact, to the contrary, Kate Moss, who was in a romantic relationship with Mr. Depp for three years, which he broke off, came forward to say, no, he never pushed her down any stairs. And you heard Doug Banya, an expert in internet and social media analytics, testify to the impact that Ms. Hurd's allegations had on Mr. Depp's popularity. Ms. Hurd's lawyers tried to tell you that all of the damage done to Mr. Depp's career was because of his own behavior, because he was sometimes unprofessional or sometimes late to set. But that doesn't hold up. Mr. Depp has been a major figure in Hollywood for decades. Yes, Mr. Depp was late to set sometimes. But as, Mr. as Richard Marks testified, quote, when you hire Johnny Depp, you get all of Johnny Depp which includes being late, unquote. Keenan Wyatt, who has worked for decades as a sound engineer on some of Mr. Depp's films, said much the same thing. And by the way, Mr. Wyatt is not and never has been an employee of Mr. Depp. He's just worked with him on, on movies. Mr. Depp wasn't canceled by Hollywood because he was sometimes late to set. He was canceled because Ms. Heard falsely accused him of domestic violence and sexual violence on the pages of the Washington Post on December 18, 2018, repeating the prior lies of May 17, 2016. And as you saw at trial, Ms. Hurd published the op-ed on December 18, 2018, two years after her public allegations of domestic abuse. Ms. Hurd's publication of the op-ed coincided with the release of her major movie, Aquaman, that December. And it coincided as well with her announcement on Twitter that she was becoming an ACLU ambassador for women's rights. And in that op-ed, Ms. Hurd repeated her false allegations against Mr. Depp. Now, she didn't mention his name. She didn't have to. Everyone knew exactly who and what Ms. Hurd was talking about. Ms. Hurd got on the stand and tried to tell you that the op-ed was not about Mr. Depp. She then said, well, it wasn't just about Mr. Depp. But she couldn't deny, and this was yesterday, that this was at least partly about Mr. Depp. The op-ed obviously is about Mr. Depp. And the testimony at trial proves that. You will recall testimony from the ACLU's representative, an attorney, stating that Mr. Depp's name was included in drafts of the op-ed and that they and others understood that the op-ed was about Mr. Depp. Specifically, the ACLU representative testified, among other things, quote, based on my review of prior drafts of the op-ed, I knew that they were that she was referring to Johnny Depp and the marriage, unquote. Ms. Hurd's claim that the op-ed is not about Mr. Depp is just another one of her many, many lies. In fact, what you have seen time and time again through the course of this trial is that Ms. Hurd lies. She lies all the time about things that are important and the things that aren't important. She just can't seem to stop. And as Ms. Vasquez said, 
What she routinely does is she doesn't take ownership or responsibility for anything, and she has an excuse for everything. But in this courtroom, confronted with the evidence, she can't run away from her own words. As my colleague said, words matter, and Ms. Hurd is condemned by her own words. So Tom, let's please take a look at the words she used in her op-ed, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, and which Ms. Hurd published in December 2018, two years after she first publicly accused Mr. Depp of being an abuser on May 27, 2016. The title of the op-ed reads, as you can see, quote, Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change, unquote. Below that, Ms. Heard states, quote, then two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out, unquote. And below that, Ms. Heard states, quote, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse, unquote. Each of those statements clearly refers to Ms. Heard's allegations against Mr. Depp. And taken collectively, their message and their implication about Mr. Depp is clear, i.e. that Ms. Heard is a survivor of domestic abuse, and that Mr. Depp is a perpetrator. The context in the rest of the op-ed op -ed makes that clear as well. Consider, for instance, this line, quote, imagine a powerful man as a ship, like the Titanic. That ship is a huge enterprise. When it strikes an iceberg, there are a lot of people on board desperate to patch up holes not because they believe in or even care about the ship, but because their own fates depend upon the enterprise, unquote. Everyone in Hollywood knew, and everyone in this courtroom now knows exactly what Ms. Heard intended those words to mean. The ship, the Titanic, is, is Mr. Depp, and Ms. Heard was the iceberg that sank him. That's precisely what Ms. Heard was saying in the op-ed. And in just the same way, everyone in Hollywood knew, and else, Hollywood and elsewhere knew exactly what Ms. Heard meant by the words, quote, two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, unquote. That was a clear reference to the day, two years earlier, on May 27, 2016. And as Ms. Vasquez said, that was six years to the day. That's when his life ended. That was six years ago to this day when Ms. Heard, on May 27, 2016, walked into court with her, with her publicist, Jody Gottlieb, having tipped off TMZ with an alleged mark on her face to accuse Mr. Depp of abuse. As always, as always, Ms. Heard was quite mindful of her image. She was careful to portray herself as the innocent representative of abuse survivors, and by implication, Mr. Depp as the perpetrator of domestic abuse. She was the woman who, in the words of her title, supposedly, quote, spoke up against sexual violence, unquote. Now, Ms. Heard has done a lot to try to walk away from the title, in particular. That's true to form. She has testified that she didn't write it, and she will argue later that she shouldn't be held liable because she didn't write it. But as the court's instructions, which you heard this morning, make clear, Ms. Heard didn't have to personally write any part of the op-ed for her to defame Mr. Depp through implication in the Washington Post. And let's please, Tom, uh, turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 3. Ms. Heard, as you all can see on the screen, retweeted the article, including the title on her Twitter page. Ms. Heard put her name on it, and she proudly declared, quote, today I published this op-ed in the Washington Post, ellipsis, unquote. Her tweet includes the title with the words, quote, I spoke up against sexual violence, unquote, 
prominently featured. Nowhere in this tweet or anywhere else does Ms. Heard disavow the title. To the contrary, she's proclaiming it. And at the same time Ms. Heard posted this tweet, she posted another, which you can see right beneath it. Quote, I'm honored to announce my role as an ACLU ambassador on women's rights, unquote, aggrandizing herself at the expense of Mr. Depp. So make no mistake, this was about Mr. Depp. In the wake of the Me Too movement, with her ACLU ambassadorship and a major movie coming out, Ms. Heard was trading on her accusations of abuse against Mr. Depp. She was reminding everyone of those allegations. She was once again taking on the role of her lifetime, the heroic survivor of vicious abuse, or to use her phrase, quote, a public figure representing abuse. And she was once again casting Mr. Depp as the villain in her drama, the supposed perpetrator of that abuse. When you meet to deliberate this case, you're going to be tasked with several questions. Those questions appear on a form that you will use to reach your verdict in this case. So I'd just like to ask you, please, to spend a few minutes with me going through that. Tom, would you please uh, put up the special verdict form so the jury can see it? Some of it's hard to read, so maybe Tom might please blow it up. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you will see here the first page of the verdict form relating to Mr. Depp's claim for defamation against Ms. Hurt. There are three pages relating to Mr. Depp's claim, one for each of the three defamatory statements in the op-ed that form the basis of Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Hurt. You've heard those three statements many times, but they bear repeating, I promise, just once more here. Uh, one. Quote, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change, unquote. Two, then two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out, unquote. Three, I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse, unquote. Now, there are seven questions that you will need to please answer with respect to each of those statements. So that's 21 questions, I think, but seven as to each statement. One, was the statement made or published by Ms. Hurd? Two, was the statement about Mr. Depp? Three, was the statement false? Four, did the statement have a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp? Five, was the defamatory implication designed and intended by Ms. Heard? Six, was the defamatory implication conveyed to someone other than Mr. Depp? Seven, did Ms. Heard make the statement with actual malice, which is your honor, her honor explained, meaning did Ms. Heard make the statement knowing it was false or with reckless disregard as, as to the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence clearly shows that the answers to those seven questions are all yes. And if you answer yes to all of those questions, which you should, we respectfully submit, you will be asked to state the amount of damages to which Mr. Depp is entitled. In the wake of the Me Too movement, movie producers know better than to cast a movie star who has been accused of domestic and sexual violence. And it is entirely within your discretion as jurors to quantify the amount of money that constitutes fair compensation for Mr. Depp's pain and humiliation inflicted by Ms. Heard's defamation. But while Mr. Depp certainly is entitled to monetary compensation, this case, at least for Mr. Depp, has never been about money. This case for Mr. Depp 
has never been about money. Nor is, about, is it about punishing Ms. Hurd. It is about Mr. Depp's reputation and freeing him from the, pr the prison in which he has lived for the last six years, and it's six years to the day. The most important questions for Mr. Depp, the ones truly at the heart of this case, are questions two, three, and four on the verdict form. And while Tom's pulling that up, let's take question two. Thank you, thank you. Were the statements about Mr. Depp? Yes. Two points here. One, when the ACLU pitched the, the op-ed to the Washington Post, I think you'll remember this, they pitched it as, quote, a piece by Amber Heard, who, as you know, was beaten up during her brief marriage to Johnny Depp, unquote. That's how they pitched it. Two, after the op-ed was published, news outlets, including USA Today, and you've seen that, that was an exhibit, characterized the op-ed as ref referring to Ms. Heard's allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp. So the USA Today interpreted it that way, and so did many other publications. They got exactly the implication that Ms. Heard and the ACLU intended them to have. Tom, if you would please pull up plaintiff's exhibit 409 and 411, if you could put them side by side. And this was expected. This is what they wanted. There had been a lot of press two years prior to the publication of the op-ed about Ms. Hurd's claims of abuse against Mr. Depp when she walked into court with her publicist to, to obtain the domestic violence, the no notice, ex parte, meaning Mr. Depp's lawyer was not informed and he was already in New York, which he testified Ms. Hurd was well aware of. You don't need a domestic violence restraining order when your husband is halfway across the continent and is heading for a European tour. On May 27, 2016, with a purported mark on her face, everyone knew exactly who, who and what Ms. Heard was referring to in the op-ed. She was referring to Mr. Depp. Let's take uh, questions two and three next, if we can. Were each of the statements false? And did the statements have a defamatory implication on Mr. Depp? Again, the clear answer is yes. The statements understood in the context of the op-ed itself and in the broader context of the press coverage of Ms. Heard walking into the court with a mark on her face to obtain a domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp in May 2016 imply, clearly imply, that Mr. Depp physically and sexually abused Ms. Heard. The overwhelming evidence that you all have heard and has come forward in this case shows that those allegations are false and despicably false. Mr. Depp did not physically abuse Ms. Heard. He did not sexually abuse Ms. Heard. You've heard audio after audio where Ms. Heard admits that she was physically abusing him. While Mr. Depp's name will be forever tarnished by these horrendous and false allegations, this case is about telling you his story and the truth about what really happened, which you've now heard. It is about restoring his lost reputation. It's about showing Mr. Depp's children, Lily Rose and Jack, that the truth is worth fighting for. It is. And it's about restoring Mr. Depp's name and standing in the community to the fullest extent that you can. And you can do something. And only you, ladies and gentlemen, can do that for him. You heard from Mr. Depp yesterday that he has been carrying these outlandish, outrageous stories on his back, pretty stoically. 
and living them with them for six years and waiting to be able to bring his truth out. And he has told you the truth, the unvarnished truth, even truth that pretty embarrassing. He knew that was going to happen when he brought this case. You've seen the evidence in this case over six long weeks, which we again thank you for. That evidence shows overwhelmingly that Ms. Hurd's attempt to paint herself as a heroic survivor, an innocent survivor, and Mr. Depp as a terrifying abuser are utterly false. We ask you to please return your verdict for Mr. Depp. We ask you, we implore you to give him his name, his reputation, and his career back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a break at this time. Um, again, this case has not been submitted to you yet. We will continue with closing arguments when we come back. So do not discuss the case with yourselves. Don't do any outside research, okay? Thank you.